Welcome to episode 57 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links that I talk about as part of this episode at the show notes, which is www7, so S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 56. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Health advice that's more than just about how you look. And here's your host, Chris Sandel. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. It's another show where it's me interviewing a guest, and this week's guest is Kamal Patel. Kamal is a nutrition researcher with an MPH and MBA from John Hopkins University, and is on hiatus from a PhD in nutrition, in which he researched the link between diet and chronic pain. He's published peer-reviewed articles on vitamin D and calcium, as well as a variety of clinical research topics. And Kamal is the director of examine.com, which is an independent and unbiased encyclopedia on supplements and nutrition. So I've been following and using examine.com for the last two or three years. Whenever I'm doing research on supplements or certain minerals or nutrients or herbs, it is always the first place that I go. And so I wanted to invite Kamal on the show to talk about research, uh, supplements, the the supplement industry. And so we cover what I say some of the biggest issues with research, what are the most valid forms of research, what supplements are typically safe for everyone and ones that people maybe should be avoiding, and also end up talking about meditation and why it is possibly the best supplement that someone could be taking. One thing I want to mention with Real Health Radio is that not every episode is going to appeal to every person, and that I'm okay with. People follow my work for a variety of reasons, and so by catering to one part of my audience, another part is probably going to be disinterested in a topic. So if you're someone who struggles with body image or disordered eating, and that's why you normally follow me, this one probably isn't going to be much interest to you. But if you like the slightly nerdier side of health and nutrition and understanding research, then you will enjoy this show. So with that preamble out of the way, this is my interview with Kamal Patel. Hey, Kamal, thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure. So you are the director of examine.com, which is definitely something I want to chat with you about today. But why don't you start by just talking about like your background and how you got into nutrition research? Sure. So um, I think the first time I started looking in earnest at research was uh, when I was in college. So in the late 90s, yeah. um, I lifted a weight for the first time in the gym um, okay. and I I couldn't do it. So I, I had never really been in athletics before and um, it was a bit embarrassing. So, so I didn't lift a weight again for a year. And then uh, I had a, a guy who lived next to me in the dorm who was huge. He was a power lifter. Um, he happened to be, a, I think, an amateur world record holder. So I just asked him straight up what he did. And he told me, most importantly, um, you need to learn about nutrition, find out what to eat and uh, how to make stuff and cook. Um, and that's much more important than micromanaging sets and reps. So I got into that first, um, and then the weightlifting came later on. And uh, fast forward about five or ten years, I got more interested in public health than in sports nutrition. Uh, and now I'm at examine.com where basically we look over studies all day, every day, whether it's for health or for sports nutrition. Okay. And was nutrition something big when you were growing up? Like what was your, your household like in terms of, of eating and, and thoughts around food? So my family is vegetarian, so there's no meat in the house. Um, every 10 years or so, I, I vacillate between thinking it was unhealthy or healthy. So uh, – <laughs> I didn't like spicy food growing up, even though my my grandma cooked for me and every meal was spicy. So I basically just ate um, chips and, and cookies and stuff all day. But I didn't eat a, a ton of uh, fast food and that sort of thing. So I guess it was okay. And then I started eating meat more as I got older. Um, and I, I still don't love meat um, as much as I love, I guess, junk food, other types of junk food. But um, And I really thought twice about nutrition growing up. And now I spend a lot more time thinking about, uh, you know, like not just uh, sort of like what our ancestors ate, but what my 
direct lineage eight. That's the wrong word. The opposite of lineage predecessors. Yeah. So, uh, so basically I think that my, you know, great grandparents and such were a bit different probably than in most parts of the world, because I think Western India has a longer and, and uh, greater history of vegetarianism than pretty much any place in the world. So, yeah. um, almost everybody's great grandparents and their great grandparents ate some kind of meat, but I'm pretty sure mine didn't going back for, I don't know how many hundreds of years. So I'll never know exactly what that entails, if anything for myself and for my gut and whatnot, but uh, I like looking into that. Okay. And because they're not eating much meat, is their protein intake also quite low or lower or are they making up the difference with beans and pulses and other stuff? Yeah, it is actually quite low. So even though they eat beans um, and pulses and stuff, growing up I had white rice for dinner 99% of the days. So, you know, beans and legumes might be half of the days. And if you're not eating meat, you're basically just getting uh, those pulses, beans and legumes plus some dairy and that's it. So that's rarely if ever enough protein. But um, longevity is, is pretty decent for my family. So, um, you know, longevity could be inversely tied to protein intake. Nobody really knows. Uh, but I'm sure they would have possibly done a bit better health wise with more protein. I just don't know if a lot of protein is as necessary, at least for lifespan and, uh, longer term health as some people think. Yeah. And I guess if they're not, then doing the like heavy weight lifting that you commented on before, it's probably not as important. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you're the director of examer.com. Um, do you want to explain like a, how the site came about? And I know like it started, uh, or it wasn't started by yourself and you were brought in at, at some later point, but just like explain a bit about how it began, how you joined. And also for people who don't know what examine.com is like explain a little about the website. Sure. So, um, basically about five years ago, uh, the founder founders of Examine met on Reddit, so they were on uh, Reddit Fitness and also talking about nutrition and stuff like that. And eventually, um, they started talking and figured out there's no place on the internet that had kind of uh, systematized research. So there were a lot of great blogs and um, and other places to get information, but there weren't places that didn't sell a supplement product. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, analyze supplements deeply. So basically, they just started a website from the ground up with the most important couple supplements like creatine, fish oil, and that kind of thing, um, and then grew it over the next couple of years. But then eventually, they had to make money, you know, because you have to pay people and hosting and stuff. So yeah. Um, so I came on board um, soon thereafter, and I had a, a background in uh, meta analysis and research synthesis. So now our goal is to continue building up our supplement entries um, and then also get more into nutrients and nutrition. Okay. And so on the like content side of things, how does examine.com work? Like, so for example, if you're wanting to add a new herb or a new nutrient or a supplement on the site, like what's that process look like? How does it work with the researchers, with the writers, like the whole, the whole shebang? So, um, we have coverage for most micronutrients, but basically the the way that we think about what to do next and how to build that is we get a lot of feedback, uh, solicited or unsolicited from people <laughs> um, asking about, you know, what do you think about uh, this form of this crazy supplement or how many times you have to take this? And then we kind of gauge what people are interested in. And then we also see where the most new research is. So for example, I want to get a lot more on our site about fat soluble vitamins because um, like the exciting new research doesn't seem to really be about like B vitamins and stuff. It seems to be about uh, vitamin A and K and D and, and whatnot. Yeah. So once we get uh, that in our heads, then basically the systematic review process that um, that researchers use to publish papers is what we do, but we do it on a lot smaller scale. So in my previous position, um, working at a university at a place called the Evidence-Based Practice Center, there's, I think, 13 of those in the U.S., and they're the ones who get um, contracted out by the federal government to do research for basically any medical topic. So, uh, like, uh, should women get mammograms at a certain age? Uh, what's the best treatments for prostate cancer? Um, the first project I was involved in was the 2010 vitamin D guideline revision here. So, 
the government contracts it out to one of those centers and then there's a team of somewhere between three to ten people with the primary investigator, statistician, and then researchers and sometimes um, clinical practitioners who come you know, more with the clinical side rather than the research side. And you do a, a literature search um, with all possible terms, narrow it down to the relevant studies. We basically only do randomized control trials at examine.com. Um, and then we evaluate study quality. So it's it's a tough one because there's a lot of trials out there and a meta-analysis will try to eliminate trials that don't seem to answer the question, but um, trial quality varies so much because uh, there could be trials that weren't published, for example. There's trials that are published but have weird conclusions. There's a lot of statistical weird things that happen. So uh, we try to go through all those issues and at least note the most important things. And uh, and it's tough because some people really want to know in depth what studies say and some people are really intimidated by the website. Yep. Um, and I myself am intimidated by the website. So <laughs> I think we need to maybe spend a bit more attention on making it more accessible. Okay. And – I know. I mean, you you mentioned there about the fat soluble vitamins and and wanting to do a bit more research. I think you had Chris Masterjohn do a a, a write up or do some article for um, Examine dot com recently, and I know he does tons of, of research around fat yeah. soluble vitamins. So I didn't know if if he's helping out with any of that stuff. Yeah. So um, we are as when we finish our micronutrient entry, so all minerals all relevant minerals and all vitamins, um, then our, our next step is going to be we're going to have people like Master John and primary researchers go through all the most important points in the summaries. Um, and we haven't gotten there yet, but, you know, Master John would be the ideal candidate for fat-soluble vitamins. Um, and then at that point, it's, I guess, our next step is going to be to systematize it. So right now we have some gaps in like our calcium entry and, you know, that kind of thing. Once we get everything filled out, then our goal more or less is to be like, you know, the website IMDB for yep. movies. Yep. Um, so like when you look up a nutrient right now, then the sidebar on Google is the Wikipedia entry for the nutrient, which is great because Wikipedia is, you know, always uh, checked by the public and it's quite thorough. But we want to be like IMDB or Wikipedia for nutrients. Yeah. So I'd say we're maybe like. Uh, a little over halfway there right now, and hopefully we'll be all the way there in a few months. Okay. And given your your knowledge, your background, your expertise, I'd love you to talk a little bit about like the different types of research and looking at like what's more robust and what isn't so robust or what's more preliminary. Um, I don't know how easy it is for you to chat about this and make it understandable for, for a mm -hmm. layperson, but it's something that people are really confused about, and most of the time when they hear about research is normally like sensationalized headlines and most people then don't know how valid that is so yeah any anything you yeah. can talk about with research would be great so um usually when you hear about research then you hear about a trial but i think it's a fairly narrow view so if i had to give sort of a evidence 101 then it would be that the the hierarchy of evidence that people usually say is um, observational evidence or case studies are at the bottom. So that's like, you know, 53 year old woman, um, breaks her arm and gets some weird disease and then some kind of treatment helps it, uh, or observational evidence. Like, uh, we looked at the habits of, uh, this many people and it turns out smoking is associated with, you know, some disease. So that stuff goes at the bottom traditionally. And then, uh, some other types of evidence capped, or capping at a randomized controlled trial, double blinded, is near the top. And then an accumulation of that evidence, a quantitative synthesis, a meta analysis, is at the very top. So that's the conventional view that if you pull together all the data from randomized controlled trials in a meta analysis, that's the highest form of data. It's yeah. the gold standard. It'll answer a question like, does vitamin D help um, prevent fracture? You know, and then they gave vitamin D for 1,000 IU to 200 people and then placebo to other people and they follow them for the course of two years. And then there's like 20 trials similar to that and then they pull all the results. But in my experience, the meta-analysis is not actually 
at the top of the evidence hierarchy because um, it is true that it's a great way to synthesize data if you have a lot of different studies and you know if you have a lot of studies and there's no way to go through them and subjectively say well you know I think all these studies show that vitamin D is pretty good for prevention of fractures so you do need meta analysis but meta analysis is also one of the most leading misleading things in research because yeah. You know, like in randomized trials, people will say, oh, the p-value was less than 0.05, so that shows that vitamin D does help prevent fracture. You know, that's not true because it's a statistical explanation of chance. So there be, due to the results of the study, there's a high likelihood that vitamin D does help. But it's easy to fudge stats, sort of. Um, it's easy to design a trial so it's a bit more likely for something to happen or not happen. So really, I think what the, the best form of evidence is, is looking at the most important and largest and well-designed randomized trials, um, because only there can you see who the specific population is, because a meta-analysis will look at all the populations that all the studies did, whether it's 20 to 30-year-old women, 70 to 80-year-old men, um, you know, pre-diabetics, they could lump all of them together. But if you're, let's say, a 40-year-old man, and you're looking at vitamin D for a specific purpose, if you find a trial that looked or at least had enough men in it and maybe even separated them out and that looked at the dosage that you're taking and it was highly controlled and it was in a high-impact journal, yeah. that's a lot more valuable than a meta-analysis. So I'd say when you are when you get media reports of a certain trial showed something or maybe a review uh, showed something, that doesn't mean anything in and of itself. Unfortunately, you have to look at the actual paper, um, and I guess that's where we come in. And are there certain red flags that you look for when you're going through research, or are there like habits that you've noticed as part of research that are often skewing the results? Yeah. So the probably the number one thing that um, screws up papers is well, actually, there's a lot of things. So <laughs> um, so one is uh, so there's a misunderstanding of sometimes when people see really small trials, you know, like. Uh, a trial of 15 to 20 people, they'll be like, oh, well, yeah, it showed that vitamin D was better, but the trial was so small, so you can't trust the um, result. That's actually not quite true because the smaller the trial, the more likely it is that there will not be a difference found between groups because of t statistics. So if the p-value does show that there is a difference between groups, it's actually – you know, that's a pretty strong conclusion that even with 20 people, there was still a difference between groups. Uh, but then the opposite happens quite a bit. So like some of the bigger uh, research groups, um, like the Harvard School of Public Health, although they mostly do observational trials, some of the bigger groups will have trials of like two to 300 people. And then it, it shows that, you know, let's say eating uh, polyunsaturated fats is better than eating monounsaturated fats for some weird cardiovascular outcomes. Um, First of all, it, the bigger your sample size, the more likely it is that you'll find a difference in something. Yeah. Second of all, the more of those some things you look for, the more likely it is that you'll find a difference. So in a trial like that, if you're comparing omega-6 oils versus uh, monounsaturated fats, and out of your 10 cardiovascular outcomes like LDL, HDL, LDL, HDL ratio, uh, LDL particle count, triglycerides, blah, 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 if you find two to three of them to be significant, that doesn't mean much because there's so many outcomes you're going to find some that are significant. So a lot of papers are like that. Larger sample sizes, a lot of outcomes looked at, they pick out the ones that were significant and they report on those. So you have to look at the results section, not the abstract. The abstract is more than half the time extremely misleading. And there was even a, a study that I posted, I think, on, on Facebook a couple days ago that looked at vitamin D synthesis. Uh, from uh, from different amounts of sun exposure, and it says something like, you know, according to our model, uh, light skinned, a uh, fair skinned person needs uh, five to ten minutes of sunshine to get a sufficient amount of vitamin D. But their conclusion was, um, getting sun exposure is a way to get vitamin D, but because of the well known risks of UV light on human skin. Supplementing vitamin D is the prudent course of action for for humans. So I was like, where did that come from? Because <laughs> in the intro, they didn't talk about that. In the results, they didn't talk about it. They just randomly threw it in the conclusion. So that is not screened out for in peer review. Once they uh, vet your 
basically statistics, uh, read through the whole paper, make sure things aren't really off. If you're a big name lab, you can get things published and have really weird abstracts and really weird conclusions. So that's kind of all up in the air. It's, it's, you know, depending on who writes it, you could have different things. When I've written papers, they don't really even check over the conclusions much. They just make sure that the methods are okay. So basically you can't trust what you read and not just from media, from the papers themselves. Okay. And that then makes it really difficult for most people because they aren't going to be able to understand the the maths and understand the probability and all of that as part of the actual um, research. And so I guess that's where examine.com comes in because they're able to then do that for people that because they just can't do it themselves. Yeah. In an ideal world, um, most people who are interested in health would know a, a couple important things about studies and stats, and we would fill in the rest. Because even if you know how to read a study, uh, oftentimes you can't get a study unless you're affiliated with the university, or it just takes so long to read these really dry papers. So, um, you know, if uh, primary school or whatever, secondary school education was more thorough in teaching about health and uh, health research and stuff, people would know like what a p-value is, uh, what the difference is between like a randomized trial and a, a single arm trial or a case control study and just some other very basic stuff that you could learn in like two days. And then they could read a website like ours to see what the actual studies say. And then if they have like a medical condition and they want to read further about a paper and it happens to be openly available, then they could read the full study. So society will never get there, but hopefully sometimes when people read the website, then they'll be so interested that they'll learn a little bit about papers, read, you know, read a paper and then go back to our site to see what other papers said. Have you at examine.com ever thought of creating a little short course that people could buy so they could learn the the basics of of reading and understanding research because I think that would be a fantastic yeah. thing for people. So uh, funny enough, we we just started talking about it. Uh, I mean, it's been in discussion for a while, but I, I think we're probably going to do something. The, the, the issue is that some people, like probably people listening to this podcast, um, would really like learning about research. And, um, and I like learning about research, but even when I took biostats. So we had to take six biostats classes. And by the fourth one, I was really bored and I'm starting to get hard. So, um, so it's like, you know, we how much information do you put in? And basically we need to make money to keep, you know, paying the bills. So what's the best, uh, kind of content for us to include? So I'd like to have something that has at least enough research background that people can understand things. And I'm pretty sure that'll happen. Um, I just don't know the exact timeline. Okay. Um, and so obviously you talked a little about some of the problems with, with research. What are some of the biggest issues you see within the supplement industry? Because obviously you're writing a lot of reviews for supplements, mm-hmm. but more like generic in terms of vitamin D as opposed to specific brands or anything like that. Yeah. So one issue is that um, it's very hard to tell whether the research team was influenced at all by the uh, funder. So a lot of supplement trials are funded by manufacturers and that's totally fine because the NIH won't or can't fund everything um, and neither can universities. But some of the time the research might be influenced but it's not like the, the study findings are wrong, it's just that the trial design may have been influenced. But you can't tell that even by looking at the disclosure sometimes at the end of the paper. So it's kind of a minefield. And you also won't know whether there's been previous trials done that showed no effect. So if there's like, uh, let's say a nitric oxide booster, testosterone booster or something, and there's a trial that showed in uh, 15 people that it had a strong effect, that's all well and good. But you won't know whether there were two other trials before that that showed no effect because there is no obligation to publish a study once the research is done. The only way to know for sure, and this is only partially for sure, is to go to clinicaltrials.gov, which is the website by the U.S. federal government that records all clinical trials. So in my previous job, we were the kind of stewards of that website contracted by the government. And part of my job was to go through the trials, you know, like a pharmaceutical trial by Pfizer or a trial by a supplement company or a medical device trial and see if anything seemed fishy, whether we should go back to the the, uh, people who are conducting the trial and ask them about more clarification. So through that, I saw that there's a lot of trials where basically 
it was most important for the researchers to find a positive finding rather than to design a good trial. And yeah. oftentimes they wouldn't even agree on like how something as basic as mortality was defined, which is scary. And then we actually ended up writing a paper on how the difference in the definition of mortality is very wide. So it's not standard to say whether a death was classified as a side effect, as something unrelated to the medication, um, or even just not recorded at all because it happened after the study officially closed. So if mortality isn't standard, you can be sure that side effects are not standard. And it's always important to note that studies are never large enough to see all the side effects. A study might be large enough to be statistically powered to find out whether like vitamin D is different than placebo, but it will never be large enough to find for sure whether vitamin D causes certain side effects reliably. So let's say our knowledge of vitamin D's effects is at like a B minus right now on a scale of A to F. Our knowledge on side effects is like a D. Luckily with vitamin D, there's not going to be a ton of side effects unless you have like a weird disease like sarcoidosis or something. But um, for a particular supplement, something that's not natural like vitamin D, there's a pretty high chance that there are side effects that nobody knows about, especially because people combine supplements with other supplements almost all the time. So they're all bets are off. Okay. So as a lay person who is then trying to make some decisions about what supplements, what brand to buy, that kind of thing, what would your advice be for someone to to make that decision? So um, the number one thing is to avoid unknown cheap brands. You know, I'm not saying that they're scams. It's just that it's a lot more likely that they'll have adulterants and that kind of thing. Um, and the second thing is, although there are um, different certifications that you can uh, put on the label of your supplement, so those those are great to have to show that the bottle actually contains what they say it contains, but that means almost nothing as far as the, the end result is, which is you want the supplement to help you. You know, you do want to make sure that it has what it's supposed to have, but it's arguably more important that it'll help you. So once you know that the supplement doesn't have weird, dangerous stuff in it, you just don't want to waste your money, and that's where the efficacy comes in. And people get confused sometimes. They'll see like, you know, three different seals from different um, certification boards, and they'll be like, oh, it's a good supplement. It's fairly expensive. It has good history. They cite a trial. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> so basically, when you look at a supplement, first you have to think um, sort of I don't, both inductively and deductively. So um, deductively, you start with, you know, what am I eating? Uh, is this something I'm missing from my diet, or am I supplementing some compound? for a medical condition. Um, and then you could also think inductively, which is, uh, you know, I, I like quantified self kind of stuff, but not so much like tracking 10 things every day, but yeah. more so making qualitative observations about things. So like, what was my mood like? What were my bowel movements like? What was my energy like during a workout? Um, if you do something as little as like, writing down a paragraph of what your day was like when you take a supplement or a group of supplements and then noting that for the past two weeks, that's a very simple way to see if anything is changing because you shouldn't keep taking a supplement if it isn't doing anything observable or if it doesn't have extremely strong evidence for preventing health complications later on in life. And people seem to take stuff like a multivitamin every single day for no good reason and, you know, like a quarter of those people probably eat fairly healthy diets. So there's no real reason other than just weird peer pressure to take something. Yeah. And I mean, just from, from what you said there in terms of supplements that people probably shouldn't be taking, like are there like three or four or five things that you think have been like blown way out of proportion and the supplements that really just aren't worth the money and the time? And then the, the opposite is going to be the follow-up question, which is like what are three or five supplements that most people should be taking or a pretty good safe bet across the board? So the two supplement categories that are always a waste of time are testosterone boosters and fat loss supplements. So testosterone boosters, 99% of the time don't do anything or they help libido, which you translate as helping testosterone, but doesn't actually most of the time. And um, fat burners don't work unless you do it uh, very systematically with a couple of the key ones. So caffeine stacks often help um, fat loss a bit. 
and then green tea and certain populations, especially obese people, um, could help. But there's not very much else that helps. But then a couple of the major supplements, actually three of the, the biggest supplement categories are also usually overused. So multivitamins, like I said, um, if you eat a really crappy diet, it's better to take a multivitamin than not to because you're not getting many nutrients in your diet and you need to at least get some. But for everybody else, an arbitrary amount of nutrients taken every day is neutral to possibly harmful because that's on top of enriched foods and other nutrients you're getting in your diet. And there aren't really long-term studies of high doses of different vitamins. And just because something like B vitamins are water soluble doesn't mean they can't be harmful if taken in large amounts every day. So multivitamins generally aren't a good idea, especially because the forms of the vitamins in them usually aren't top notch. Like most multivitamins have magnesium oxide as their magnesium form, which in large amounts is a laxative. So you definitely don't want that because absorption is quite low. So you'd want to take a magnesium chelate instead and that's usually in the form of a separate pill because it's so bulky. You don't want to have like one huge multivitamin pill. Um, so multivitamins usually aren't a great idea. And then fish oil, people will take a lot of fish oil because they want to like prevent inflammation or treat inflammation or prevent heart disease. Fish oil does not really help prevention of heart disease. Um, there was a big story by the New York Times last year and they asked us, you know, what does the evidence say? So we had this long call, but then at the end I was just like, you know, basically every study I cited shows that there is very little, if any, effect of fish oil and the biological plausibility doesn't really make sense because if you eat a diet that um, has a normal amount of fat, then the amount of fish oil that counteracts that fat is so small. It's like if you eat 20 to 40 grams of fat a day and then you take three fish oil pills, what's that going to do? It's so little compared to the amount of other fats in your diet. So um, fish oils, especially because if you get a lower quality one, it's easily oxidized. Um, generally not a great idea, except for if you have certain medical, medical conditions, it could help like uh, treatment resistant depression, for example. Uh, but then some supplements are generally a, a good idea. And those are ones that have very low side effects and are usually pretty cheap and widely available and are healthy for things other than one specific purpose. So blueberries, um, blueberries are, it's it's tough to say because it's not like blueberries are a superfood. It's just that blueberries have been researched more than some other fruits. But okay. blueberries okay. help cognition, especially for older people. But it's one of the only supplements or foods that could help cognition in younger people. So blueberries also happen to taste really good. So that is a quote unquote supplement. You know whether you eat them, drink juice, or take a, a powder or a pill, that are probably a good idea. Garlic also fits into that category. But then as far as like nutrient sort of pills go, vitamin K2 is probably the one that comes to mind because people don't get much vitamin K2 in their diet. Most people think vitamin K is vitamin K, but K1 is completely unrelated to K2, K1 being the one that most doctors think of. Um, and even a, a previous roommate of mine who was a physician um, didn't know what vitamin K2 is. So a lot of physicians are pretty unaware of it. Um, Vitamin K2 is sort of a huge gap in cardiovascular health because it can prevent calcification of arteries. So uh, vitamin K2, because of those things and the fact that it doesn't have a known upper tolerable limit, so you can take almost any amount and it probably won't do anything bad, um, it's pretty much a slam dunk. You know, there's nothing, no reason not to take it except for potentially cost, but it's it's not that expensive per dose. Um, so those things, and I guess creatine, because creatine can also have benefits for uh, things outside of the gym, um, such as cognition and depression, uh, those things are pretty good bets. Okay. And how has your opinion and thoughts about supplements changed through working through examine.com and like the research you've done as part of that? Because obviously you, you got into it, um, as you mentioned at the beginning, through changing your diet and then getting more into to lifting weights but i guess you've done a hell of a lot more research now at examine.com so it'd be interesting to hear how it's it's changed in your opinion well um the, when i first started doing research then you know even when i was uh in the phase where i was trying to publish papers i basically would look at a paper and either highly critique it and uh and tell people this paper was wrong or I would tout it. Like if there was a paper that showed something that I didn't know, I would, I'd be like, Hey, look, this, this paper like could change your life. So now my opinion is always more subtle because I realize that no matter how much I know, 
I can only have deep knowledge in like one or two things. Yeah. But things related to supplements and nutrition and health are not just under the field of nutrition. It's basically biochemistry, epidemiology, um, cell biology, physiology, uh, pathophysiology, a bunch of stuff. And I won't know a ton about any of those topics. So I'm always like, if I read a paper, it means very little in isolation. I need to, for complex topics, talk to somebody who has a lot of experience. So usually either people who are in research and are a bit older, people who have a medical condition and have researched something to death, yeah. um, or people who are just like natural geniuses are good to talk to to tie things together. So everything is really complicated. If somebody asks, why can't I sleep? Um, you know, it used to be, oh, you know, sleep hygiene. If you have regular sleep hygiene, then eventually you'll fall into uh, a regular pattern of sleep. And then I started thinking, oh, well, if you take melatonin or, oh, if you take sustained release melatonin. And then I was like, oh, no, if you block blue light or if you wear blue light blocking glasses, it's a lot more complicated than that because, um, like, we did some uh, sleep apnea research at, at uh, my previous research center and people who had sleep issues – Sometimes I tried literally everything, and it didn't matter if you put them in a completely dark room for a couple hours. It's a mix of uh, physiological and hormonal things with um, psychological things like anxiety that's difficult to treat. Um, and then sometimes even things like the type of bed you're laying on or your musculoskeletal complaints. So things just get so complicated for health issues that I don't trust my own opinion anymore, <laughs> and I always seek out other people. Okay. Um, one of the bits on your bio on exam.com said that, um, you'd been enrolled in some research for like mindfulness meditation and nutrition in low income areas. Um, mm -hmm. like I'd be fascinated to hear about like what the research was as part of that and what it found. Sure. So the, uh, meditation one was, um, I, interned a while back at a place called the Benson Henry Institute for, mindfulness. Um, I can't remember what the acronym is, but it used to be the mind body medical Institute at Harvard medical school. And it's basically their center for doing both bench research on meditation and trials. So, um, I didn't know enough to be involved in, in most of the facets really either of them. But what I did do is, um, I helped out with a trial for, um, overweight, obese, and cardiovascular disease patients who were enrolled in a three-prong program for um, helping their symptoms. One was a group exercise session. Uh, one part of it was nutrition education, and one was mindfulness meditation. So they did those. They looked at what the outcomes are, and they tied it back to whether mindfulness meditation could help both um, your brain and your habits. And it turns out that if you could this applies to a lot of things, but if you could put mindfulness meditation in a pill, it would probably be one of the strongest pills because if you're aware of your actions while you're eating, it's a lot harder to overeat. It's a lot harder to get anxious about eating and it's a lot easier to eat without distracting yourself with other stuff. So, um, actually this is a reminder to myself. I should try to work on this because sometimes <laughs> I'll, I'll go a few days or weeks and be like, I'm going to try to have some times that I'm just eating, not looking at the computer, not watching TV, even if there's nobody there, you know, I'll just eat. And then I'll forget about it when I get busy. But if you train that for a really long time um, and maybe meditate, you know, outside of that, whether it's sitting down to meditate, walking meditation, just being more aware when you're doing stuff like washing dishes, um, it's amazing how much that can change somebody's life. The devil lies in the details, however, because nobody knows how long that takes for different people. Some people, once they do it, they're like, oh, this is great. I'm going to keep doing it. Some people, it takes like two or three weeks to get used to that feeling before it, you know, some people hate it because it's so difficult at first that they can't get over that activation energy, that hump you need to make it enjoyable enough to keep doing it. So um, those are the types of things we looked at, and it was really cool. And I learned some stuff like, like mindfulness meditation is useful, but it's contraindicated for some people. Like if you have um, certain psychological conditions, mindfulness meditation could make you worse because then you're trapped in your own head and you have no distraction. So, um, you know, it's a therapy like other therapies, but it's unique in that it has benefits outside of just the indication you're looking at. It's not like um, 
you know, like some weird supplement that might help hypertension. Mindfulness meditation could help everything, basically. Yeah. And I seeing, I listen to Tim Ferriss's podcast and pretty much all the time he's having guests on and like when he's asking about their daily practices, like meditation comes up like again and again and again. And I was also listening to something with Gary Vaynerchuk where he was like meditation in the next like couple of years is just going to hit mainstream in the same way that mm-hmm. people go to yoga studios and that's become just very popular and trendy like meditation is the next big thing because of the benefits that you talked about there where it is just across the board how useful it can be yeah the way i like to think of it in terms of where meditation uh, or how popular it was before and how it might be in the future is so it used to be that there were only a certain number of things people would do in their free time. So um, I read some stat that before 1950, like a third or a half of Americans, or maybe before 1940, um, didn't have enough electricity to have lights on all the time or something like that. So before, basically our parents' parents' generation or their parents, um, the things you could do is you could talk to somebody, Yeah. Uh, you could listen to radio, You could read, you could play your piano or instrument, or you could like do something physical. So now there's that. And then there's 1 trillion things to do on the internet. Um, and all, and I think now in the U S the average electronic media consumption is 10 hours and 49 minutes a day. So it's a lot. So now it's like, there's two paths. There's the path where, um, you like spend too much time in electronic stuff and then there's the path where you start becoming more aware that it might be good to be aware and you either meditate or just try to be more aware without calling it meditation. Um, whereas it used to be that you were forced into middle road, even if you loved something like the radio, you just wouldn't listen to it all day. So you had to be aware. You had to be a bit more mindful. You didn't have your whole life being automated. So now you have to think about it, which is why I think, you know, it's true for the other stuff you heard, because if you don't make a concerted effort, you're going to go down the other path and get addicted to stuff and waste your life away on the internet. Yeah. And look, I'm personally trying to start to do more meditation myself um, because I want to see what the effects are and how much it impacts me. But I also spend 90 minutes to two hours a day walking the dog in nature. So like that at this stage has been my meditation. But I want to do the sitting down, doing headspace, doing calm or whatever to see what that's like and if that has an even further impact on things. Yeah, you know, um, it's... It's good you mentioned that because usually when, uh, like at that research center, people who did stuff like that spend a lot of time in nature, did camping, walk their dog a lot. Um, meditation was sort of a, a take it or leave it thing because meditation is, um, you know, the origins are, are, you know, lost in antiquity. But I think meditation for most cultures or religions came about as a response to something. But if you're spending a lot of time in nature or with your animal or whatever, it basically is meditation. Like there's no mystical aspect of sitting. And in fact, I think sitting meditation is a bit overrated because it doesn't apply to life as much. When your eyes are closed and you're sitting cross-legged, that's great and all and introspective and you follow your breath and stuff. But then when you open your eyes, that's life. You know, the disconnect between those two is pretty wide. Whereas when you're walking around in a forest – and then you go back to your house, you know, it's similar. You're, you get some benefits because your eyes were open, you know, you're not forcing yourself to, to be in your head. So, you know, I'm basically just saying, I wish I lived closer to the forest and had a dog. (laughs) Right. Um, so what are the goals of like examine.com, um, in both the the short and and long term? So our short-term goal is to finish our micronutrient entries. Um, our long-term goal is, so one is we started being used for continuing continuing education credits last year for um, dietitian and personal training organizations. So we want to extend that to nurses and physicians and other health professionals. Yeah. Um, and then we also want to basically be um, – so right now people who are into weightlifting, people who are into longevity, people who are just into health research in general will go to the website. But I want to have it so that somebody's mom or grandma – would know to go to the website if they're interested in some specific issue of health because there's no issue of health that nutrients and supplements doesn't address. Well, almost no issue. So 
you know, part of that is boring technical stuff so that we can be higher on search results pages. But, you know, that's uh, that's not really my expertise. So what I have to do is make sure that we're useful to people. And uh, we got messages from people and, and I try to get feedback a lot. And, you know, like just yesterday we had a, I had a call with the customer and he was like, you know, I, I ordered the research address and I love it. Um, and I kept pressing him, you know, what don't you like? And I think he was just nervous. So he's, at first he's like, oh, I like the whole thing. You know, there's nothing. But I was like, you know, just tell me, you know, I don't, <laughs> I can take it. So he was like, oh, you know, there, uh, sometimes there's a lot of articles on one overall topic. And I'd like it to be that those articles are spread out between issues, because even though gut health is important, I don't want to have three gut health articles in one issue because what if at the time I'm interested in something else and I, it just turns me off to see all those articles. And I was like, you know, putting myself into a reader's shoes, um, you can't predict what people are interested in because some people have health issues that like none of their friends know about and their family doesn't like you could have, um, like a lot of women have, um, hormonal issues or issues with frequent urination or, uh, low energy anxiety stuff that doesn't resolve with medication and might be spiraling into depression. And then they're just waiting until a piece of research comes out that can help them. So even if I might be interested in something and I'm like, Oh, we should get every important article about this and put it in this issue. Um, I'd like to have it be kind of spread out because the more I hear from people, because I only have limited clinical experience, the more I learn how people are just extremely unique and what they need to learn about. And so you mentioned there the the research digest. I mean, examine.com doesn't sell any supplements. So like how does it like make its money and mm -hmm. like what are the products that it does sell so that if, if people are interested, they can also find out and look into this stuff? So we sell three products to um, raise enough money basically to run the website. And those are the stack guides, the examine.com research digest, ERD, and the supplement goals reference. So – um, the latter is basically an easy way to access, uh, all of our research through, you know, uh, an easy PDF document, wherever you are. The second to last thing, the stack guides is for people who want a concise way to see recommendations for different health goals. So we have 17 stacks right now, testosterone, anxiety, muscle, fat, aesthetics, and skin, all basically most of the major topics. And we go through the base supplements that have a lot of research, the ones that have not quite as much research but are probably possibly useful, the ones that might have more research in the future that you might want to take a look at, and the ones that are inadvisable because either they have major side effects, uh, we don't know much about them, or there's some other thing that could trip you up, and then different ways to combine them because, like I said, studies usually don't look at combinations of supplements, so you kind of have to – um, think it out yourself, whether the mechanism by which one works could impede the way that another one works or help it. So we basically do that for you. And then the research digest is, um, eventually people start asking us, you know, we see the stuff on your website, the stack guides are a good way to see it, uh, basically a step-by-step -step of these are things you might want to take. These are things you might not want to take for this particular goal. But what if I just really love research and I want to see the most important new papers every month? So that's what we do. We select out what we think are the most important papers for nutrition and supplements and we analyze them to death. So like five to 10 pages about the latest study on vitamin D or probiotics or light exposure or some bodybuilding supplement, fat loss, whatever. Uh, we go through the strengths and weaknesses of the study, whether we think it's applicable to different types of people. Um, we have a team of five to 10 reviewers look at our analysis, um, physicians, researchers, uh, dietitians, and then only then do we put it out. So it's like a peer review of peer review. Um, so I, I guess that would be for people who are super into nutrition. The stack guides are for people who want something practical right away that they can use to affect their supplement buying decisions. Okay, cool. So look, I want to be respectful of your time and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. But before you go, uh, where should people be going to get more information? Obviously, we've said examine.com a million times. So there's that, but other places on social media, Facebook, Twitter, that kind of thing. Yeah, so at uh, Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash examine.com um, and same with Twitter. Um, I'm at facebook.com slash Miranda July. 
long story <laughs> and I'm not actually female, but, um, and you can contact me on there or through the examine.com website and I read all the emails and I try to get back to everybody. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in certain aspect of research, if you find an error on the site, anything, um, email us and we love to talk. Okay, cool. Well, look, I will put all the links there in the show notes so people can find them that way as well. But thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I really enjoyed chatting with you and I know people are going to find this really helpful. It's my pleasure. Thanks for listening to Real Health Radio. If you are interested in more details, you can find them at the Seven Health website. That's www.sevensevenhealth.com.